Mr. Speaker. It is always exhilarating to be back in Parliament and to discharge the duty in fulfillment of Article 67 of the Constitution of delivering to the House a message on the state of the nation on this occasion for the penultimate time. I have one more still to do. <laughs> In accordance with protocol and convention, it is good to see that First Lady Rebecca Kufuado, Vice President Mohamedou Baumia, Second Lady Samira Baumia, the spouse of Ms. Mr. Speaker Alice Ajwa Jonas, Chief Justice Gertrude Tokonu, and Justices of the Supreme Court, representative of the chairperson and members of the Council of State, and the new Chief of Defense Staff, Lieutenant General Thomas Opon Pepra, the Inspector General of Police, Dr. George Akufu Dampare, and service chiefs are all present, as are the Dean and members of the Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Speaker, the House is also duly honored by the welcome attendance of the former President of the Republic, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. <laughs> and former First Lady, Her Excellency Nana Konedu Ajiman Rawlins. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to be able to report that the entire territory that makes up our nation is safe, secure, and under the control of the government and people of Ghana. This might sound like a pedestrian statement with which to start a message on the state of the nation. Unfortunately, far from it being an everyday truism, this is no longer a statement or claim that can be easily made in these times in the neighborhood in which we are. West Africa is under threat of terrorism and violent extremism, rapidly spreading southwards from the Sahel to coastal West Africa. We can no longer take the territorial integrity of our countries for granted. Indeed, Many of our neighbors have already fallen victim and lost large portions of their territories to extremist groups. And Ghana, by the grace of the Almighty, is the only coastal state along the Gulf of Guinea that has so far not recorded a terrorist attack. To speak of the peace and security we have in our country has not happened by chance. It has taken deliberate policy and planning on the part of government and a lot of hard work and dedication on the part of our security services to keep our country safe and secure. I might add that it has also meant that we've had to spend a lot of money that would have otherwise have been available to spend on many of our development needs. But I believe we all agreed that the primary responsibility of the state towards its citizens is to provide and guarantee peace and security, and we're doing just that. Since we came into office, we've ensured a significant expansion of the armed forces and all the other security agencies. We're paying, we're paying diligent attention to their welfare as well. The accommodation and physical environment generally of the security agencies are being improved. We have quickened the pace of the retooling and equipping of the security agencies to ensure readiness towards the emerging security threats. For the majority of us, 
in our everyday activities. It is the security of our streets and homes and communities that concern us most. We want our children and grandchildren to grow up in a safe atmosphere. And the Ghana Police Service play the lead role in this. Again, government has performed most creditably. The police are much better equipped than they have ever been. And their increased visibility on the streets goes a long way to reassure the community. The changing image of the police is perhaps best exemplified by the dramatic facelift they have given to the frontage of the police headquarters on the ring road in Accra. It is beautiful and I recommend it to all institutions and indeed households. Whilst we're spending time, money and energy and lights keeping the country safe from external dangers, I must add that it is a matter of great concern that we continue to have so many chieftaincy and land disputes around the country, which tend to be breeding grounds for internal tensions and destabilization. Mr. Speaker, I must make special mention of the troubles in Boko. The tragedy is not only that a thriving and dynamic town is being reduced to a wasteland, a, a wasteland of destruction and distrust. We're spending money and energy that would have been better spent on developing the needs of Boko, providing security to keep brothers and sisters from killing each other. Mr. Speaker, what should concern all of us, and not just the people of Boko, is that in its current state, Boko is an alluring magnet to mischief makers and extremists operating a few kilometers away from the border. In a bid to find a lasting solution to the conflict, government has in the past year undertaken a number of measures, including the establishment of a special Boko task force and the intensification of engagements with the factions for the resolution of the chieftaincy dispute. On the recommendation of the Upper East Regional and National Security Councils, four radio stations that have been broadcasting incendiary language and propagating hate speech have been shut down by the National Communications Authority. The Chief Justice, for her part, has also recently established specialized courts in Accra and in Kumasi to deal expeditiously with criminal matters emanating from the Boko conflict. Government is determined to do all it can to ensure that there is security in every inch of the territory of our country. But it is also very much up to the citizens to help create the needed atmosphere. And I'm thus appealing to all citizens, all Ghanaians, to take the See Something, Say Something campaign of the Ministry of National Security very seriously. There is indeed, Mr. Speaker, a state of palpable anxiety and tension in every corner of West Africa, raising the specter of regional instability, which we thought had been banished. Unconstitutional changes in government in parts of Africa, especially in West Africa, through a series of coup d'etats and military interventions in governance, testified to an unfortunate democratic, democratic regression in the region. It is in the interest of democratic growth that this development is re reversed as soon as possible. And we in Ghana continue to give maximum support to ECOWAS, the regional body of West Africa, and the AU, Africa's continental organization, in their efforts to restore democratic institutions in the affected nations. We must help stem the tide of this unwelcome evolution and help entrench democracy in West Africa. We believe also that a reform of the global governance architecture, 
such as the Security Council of the United Nations, to make it more representative and accountable, will help strengthen global peace and stability, and thereby help consolidate democratic rule around the world. Mr. Speaker, we in Ghana have had our fair share of political instability and experimentation about how we should govern ourselves. There might be new names being ascribed to some of the supposed new ideas being canvassed by some today. But I dare say on close examination, we will discover that they are not new. We have tried them here, and they have failed. We know about all-powerful, cannot-be-questioned messiahs. We know about liberators, and we know about redeemers and deities in military uniform. It might sound new to some, but those of us who have been around for a while have heard the argument made passionately that democracy was not a suitable form of government if we wanted rapid development. It is a tired argument that was regularly used by apologists for coup d'etats. It is also not new to have political parties and politics in general being denigrated Indeed, there used to be national campaigns of fear, ways against politics and political parties. It took time, and it took long battles, but in the end, the consensus did emerge, and we opted for a multi-party democratic form of government under the Constitution, which ushered in the Fourth Republic. Mr. Speaker, it is not a perfect document. Constitutions do not ever pretend to be. But it has served us well these past 32 years, considering where we have come from. It is a sacred document that should not be tampered with lightly. But I hasten to add, our Constitution did not descend from heaven. We Ghanaians drew it up to serve our needs, and we can amend it to suit our changing needs and circumstances. We should work towards finding a consensus on the changes that the majority of Ghanaians want made to the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, democracies are founded on elections, and the holding of free and credible elections ensure that people have confidence in the government that emerges at the end of the process. The honorable members of this House, who are at the center of it all, know more than the rest of us that this is an election year. The increased decibel level in all communications will ensure that even the most politically uninterested person among us would know that on December 7th, we shall be going to the polls to elect a new president and new members of parliament. A lot of the responsibility lies on the Electoral Commission to put the organization in place that will ensure that we have credible elections. The government is doing its part to make the work of the Electoral Commission go smoothly. A lot of responsibility lies on the political parties as well, and I hope that the parties recognize that their credibility is also on the line, especially with some people wanting to undermine the multi-party democratic system of government. It is up to the parties to demonstrate that competitive elections are an honorable, character-enhancing experience. And that at the end of the process, the loser will congratulate the winner, and the world does not come to an end because an election has been lost. There is nothing inherently dirty or corrupt about politics and nothing about elections that should generate violence. We who are in politics, and we who are members of political parties, owe it to ourselves, the institutions we, came to be, we claim to belong to. And above all, we owe it to, to Ghana and the people of Ghana to make politics and elections the serious and joyful phenomenon they should be. In discharging their responsibility, I urge the Electoral Commission to work with the political parties to iron out whatever problems there might be 
and I'm happy that the Electoral Commission, after engaging the parties, has shelved plans to, cha to change the 7th December date. Politics, after all, has been described as the art of the possible. And if that is what we are engaged in, it should not be beyond us to resolve the problems that come up and concentrate on working to build the happy and prosperous country we want. Government on this part will do what is expected of it to make sure that the reputation of Ghana is not damaged and the free will of the people is manifested at the end of the electoral process. And I want to reassure the people of Ghana that I'll do everything in my power to help ensure the conduct of transparent, free, and fair elections on 7th December. I have confidence. I have confidence in the security services to ensure that those who might want to cause havoc or any kind of mischief to disrupt the electoral process will have no room to operate. Mr. Speaker, there are amongst us those who, for ideological or other unstated reasons, have never accepted multi-party democracy and therefore take every opportunity to portray the governance efforts in the most disparaging manner. There are also those amongst us who consider the rough and tumble of politics to be beneath them and will not want their sainted images to be solved by what they term the dirt of politics. Mr. Speaker, we can and we should continuously improve upon the performance of the institutions that hold the state together. But nobody should undermine the integrity of the arms of government for parochial reasons. There is definitely much room for improvement in the workings of the executive arm of government, the judiciary, and our parliament. Even those who have had parliaments as part of their governance systems for hundreds of years still make mistakes and sometimes get things alarmingly wrong. It would be surprising if our 31-year-old parliament did not get things wrong sometimes. This August House, which holds so many fond memories for me of my personal political journey, doesn't always measure up to the expectations of the people or even sometimes of its own members. There's a lot of anxiety currently about how our MPs get elected. There's anxiety about the rapid turnover of members in the House and the loss of institutional memory. There's a lot of anxiety about some of the procedures in the House. We will not agree, all agree with everything that the Parliament does. And I dare say, Mr. Speaker, that I do not agree with everything that goes on in here. But that is the beauty of what we as a people are trying to do in our governance structure. Mr. Speaker, the president is an appointees are not universally loved. It will be strange and unproductive if they were. It is probably worthwhile making what I consider to be important observations at this stage on some of the issues in our public discourse in the lead up to the elections for a new president. Under the Constitution, the executive power of the state is vested in the president of the republic. He or she is the executive. There's no ambiguity about where the buck stops when it comes to responsibility for hap what happens in the government. It stops with the president. He or she has ultimate responsibility. It would be an unwise president that would present, pretend to have all the answers and refuse the advice of his officials. But the fact remains that the president holds the executive power. The cabinet, the ministers of state, 
all act ultimately in an advisory manner. Of course, a member of the government might take an idea, be it generated by the president or the official or a committee, and turn it into a huge success, and the honors will be claimed or shared where public perception falls. But ultimately, the president is responsible and therefore takes the credit or the blame for, for whatever happens in his or her government. Mr. Speaker, let me make a second point. The programs that come from the executive benefit from the rigorous public examination and debates to which they are subjected. We all now take for granted and sometimes even bemoan the vigorous media and civil society organization scrutiny that characterize public discourse. It gives me quite satisfaction and great pride to hear young Ghanaians today who believe that criticizing the President of the Republic and challenging government proposals are normal, regular activities. Some of the young people listen with incredulity when they hear about a Ghana that was once without private radio stations and people had to tune into foreign stations to hear critical and opposition voices. Today, there are some 550 radio stations in operation in this country. In spite of all its shortcomings and difficulties, the people of Ghana have shown admirable commitment to multi-party democracy and have not fallen for the instigations to resort to the violent overthrow of an elected government. The past 32 years of the Fourth Republic have witnessed the most sustained period of stability and economic growth in our country. And we should be proud of what we have achieved and seek to protect and build on it. And that is why the theme for the 67th Independence Anniversary Celebration on 6th March in Koforidua is our democracy, our pride. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report on the progress we're making in the administration of justice. This past year, a total of 76 judges and magistrates were appointed. They comprised the new Chief Justice, two new Justices of the Supreme Court, 23 new High Court judges, 29 Circuit Court judges, and 21 new magistrates. 262 staff were recruited to address some of the human resource gaps created because of the newly established courts throughout the country. In January 2024, three additional justices have been appointed to the Supreme Court to replace three justices who have retired from the court. We've made unprecedented progress in the provision of court buildings and residences for judges around the country. In 2020, government set out to construct 120 courthouses with residential facilities nationwide. As of 31st January 2024, 67 courthouses had been successfully inaugurated and are in use at various sites around the country. 12 completed projects have been stated for inauguration by the end of this month of February 2024. The remaining 21 projects are various stages of completion and are expected to be completed and inaugurated before May 2024. In addition, 121 residential units have been constructed for judges throughout the country. Further, 20 fully furnished four bedroom units together with social amenities, have been constructed for justices of the Court of Appeal in Kumasi. The project is not yet complete, but we have done enough to be able to say that we have resolved the problem of the disgraceful state of court buildings. The attention now is to the digitalization process of the courts to modernize the entire system. The judicial service has undertaken a digitalization initiative
to modernize legal operations and foster greater access to justice. A virtual court system was introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure the continuity of business. The virtual court system was also rolled out to 17 courts and subsequently to 19 high courts for the smooth hearing of court cases. By the end of December 2023, 160 courts had been equipped with devices for the real-time transcription of cases, in addition to 51 courts piloting the paperless court system in Accra. The integration of real-time transcription devices in 160 courts has revolutionized the way in court proceedings are recorded and documented. The service is rolling out a comprehensive digitalization of the court system. The Attorney General has continued in a very effective manner the tradition under this administration of contesting every single litigation against the state and has avoided the numerous judgment debts that used to be given against the state. The Office of the Attorney General as a result has saved the country over 10 trillion Ghana cities. All the evidence is there. I shall be performing a pleasant duty in a few weeks' time when I commission the law house the 12-story office building which will house the offices of the Attorney General and the Ministry and finally bring to an end the age-old office accommodation problem. I must declare a personal interest in it as the building was started when I was Attorney General in the government of President John Ajakum Kufo back in 2001. Mr. Speaker, I acknowledge and share the frustration and deep disappointment we all have that a conversion of events and fate have conspired to place impediments on the path of the rapid development trajectory we were on. I'm proud that in spite of the dramatic financial crisis that we encountered in 2021, whose worst effects became manifest in 2022, the transformative measures we introduce in the first four years of office make it possible to showcase an impressive array of developmental projects across the length and breadth of the country. I do not intend to go through the long, even of interesting process of enumerating the projects the Kufuada government has undertaken since coming into office, their location, and what state of completion they are in. Mr. Speaker, with the best will in the world, there simply will not be the time to do that, even if we spend all day here. It, it will be recalled that last year, during the message on the state of the nation, faced with a similar problem about road projects, I came to the House armed with a fat book that had the details of the road projects around the country, and all honorable members were given copies to go through at their own leisure. I haven't heard anybody point out one. This year, we're taking things to a higher level. This government, after all, is the digitalization government. And the man who has led the entire digitalization process these past seven years. My indefatigable vice president. <laughs> Dr. Mohamedou Baounia. Doctor Digitalization.
the MPP's excellent presidential candidate for the 2024 election. is coming out with what will allow everyone and everybody and anyone to check on every project being undertaken by the government without having to listen to the president's message on the state of the nation. We are calling it the performance tracker. You can check and satisfy yourself about the status of the projects and their location. And you could stop by and make a physical inspection if you were so minded. Mr. Speaker, if you want to check on roads, classroom blocks or chip compounds or Agenda 111 hospitals or bridges or science laboratories or water projects or sanitation projects or landing sites and harbors and other infrastructural projects or whatever this government use your tax money to execute the key to your query is right there on your phone the speaker the performance tracker will be formally launched in march and i'm offering it as the device which will help bring accountability into your hands with the performance tracker we can be sure that never again, never again, will pictures of an artist's impression be offered as projects that have been completed. I'm able to recommend the performance tractor in the sure knowledge that the Akufuado government has done more in education in terms of student enrollment, teacher training and employment, provision of infrastructure than any government. We have similarly done more in health, agriculture, security, roads, railways, tourism, digitalization than any other government. Thanks to the performance tracker, the president no longer has to go through lists. And I have the confidence to say that every performance indicator used shows we have done more in these seven years than in any of the eight years under the National Democratic Congress. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, on coming into office seven years ago, my government took the decision as we promised to modernize and formalize the economy through digitalization. In this regard, we have embarked on one of the most far-reaching Mr. Speaker, come with me. I will have my day in Hansard. I will have my day in Hansard. Come with me. Believe you me. <laughs> Indeed, Mr. Speaker, on coming into office seven years ago, my government took the decision as we promised to modernize and formalize the economy through digitalization. In this regard, in this regard we have embarked on one of the most far-reaching digitalization exercises in Africa. Up from the figure of 900,000 which we inherited when we came into office in 2017. We have thus far enrolled 17.6 million on the Ghana card and therefore provided unique biometric identity to the majority of Ghanaians. We've also implemented a digital 
property address system with unique addresses for all properties in Ghana. Furthermore, through the implementation of mobile money interoperability, we've also provided access to financial services for adult Ghanaians through mobile money accounts that are interoperable with bank accounts. Government Ghana is now ranked number one in Africa in terms of access to financial inclusion. We have digitalized the provision of public services at the ports, DV DVLA, NHIS, GRA, births and deaths, registrar of companies, ECG, Ghana Water, amongst others. Ghana is ranked number one in West Africa and number seven in Africa in e-governance. We have also implemented the use of drones in the delivery of medicines, blood, and vaccines. And Ghana currently runs the world's largest medical drone delivery service. We have also networked all teaching regional and district hospitals and patient records can easily be accessed in these hospitals without the need for a folder. Ghana is making giant strides in the area of digitalization, thereby, thereby improving transparency, accountability, and efficiency in the public sector and accelerating the growth of our economy. We are definitely going to be part of the digital revolution that is sweeping the world. Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, last year when I came to the House to deliver the annual message on the state of the nation, we were in the midst of negotiations with the International Monetary Fund. We we're faced with a very difficult situation and had to take a lot of unpleasant but unavoidable measures to bring stability and confidence back to the economy. These included tax measures that we, we did not like, but we knew we had to take in the knowledge that the medicine would be bitter but temporary. Mr. Be Mr. Speaker, a year ago, I also stated the decision to undertake a comprehensive debt restructuring of our domestic and external debt to ensure we remain resolute in our objective to restore macroeconomic stability and sustainable growth. The decision was not an easy one, considering the complex and diverse domestic debt, debt landscape. We had to consider safeguarding the financial sector preserving social and economic conditions, and protecting our domestic debt market. A year on, I'm happy to inform you, Mr. Speaker, that we have made significant progress. We requested an unprecedented number of bondholders to participate in a vol voluntary exchange, and we were able to exchange successfully some 203 billion CVs worth of bonds. Not only was the exchange successful, but it helped us to secure within five months the shortest possible time in recent debt restructuring history, a staff level agreement to an executive board agreement with the IMF. My gratitude goes to all financial sector players, organized labor, firms, regulatory institutions, and all individuals who made this painful exercise successful. The speaker, as you may recall, government successfully paid the first coupon of 2.3 billion CDs on the new bonds on 22nd August 2023. At the time, that was the single biggest payout of domestic payments in a single day for Ghana. We then paid 2 billion and 60 million CDs for the last leg of the domestic debt exchange on 5th September 2023. 
A week ago last Tuesday, on 20th February 2024, the second coupon of 5 Point eight billion CDs was paid to domestic bondholders. This is the largest coupon paid in a day in Ghana's history. On the external debt side, we achieved a significant milestone in reach by reaching an agreement with our public creditors. And I'll use this occasion to express our appreciation to the Republic of France and the Re People's Republic of China, co-chairs of the Official Creditors Committee, for their positive roles in this achievement. We have also intensified our engagement with our external bondholders on the principles of transparency, fair treatment, consistency with the IMF debt sustainability analysis and good faith. We are focused and committed to accelerating the process. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we are committed to concluding the external debt restructuring process as soon as possible so we move past the crisis. This will enable us to complete substantially projects that have been constrained due to financial challenges. In the meantime, some of the priority projects have been transferred onto the GOG budget with the same fiscal space to ensure their completion. This will enable the Kumasi International Airport with some 98% complete to be completed by May. Other projects like the Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital, CAF, Maternity Block in Kumasi, the Takradi Interchange, the Better Bilamti Interchange in Accra, the University of Environment Sustainable Development Project at Bunsu in the Eastern Region, Phase 2 of the construction of roads in Tamari, and the construction of the 84 kilometer railway line between Tema and Nakosumbo would also be completed. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, I'm happy to announce that an alternative source of funding has also been secured for the reconstruction and completion of La Hospital Project as a fully functional modern hospital with the necessary equipment for diagnosis and treatment. The contractor has been paid an advanced mobilization of 15% representing some 7.5 million United States dollars, and work has begun. The project commenced effectively in January this year and will be completed in 28 months. Mr. Speaker, it is important to underline that the recent change in the leadership of the Finance Ministry will not affect government's determined commitment to implementing the terms agreed with the IMF to ensure that we restore, restore the economy to healthy growth as soon as possible. Indeed, the macro economy was much stronger at the end of 2023 than in 2022. Inflation which peaked at 54.4% in December 2022 has reduced to 23.5% in January 2025. Real GDP growth for the first three quarters of 2023 averaged 2.8% higher than the targeted growth rate of 1.5% for 2023. The CD has been largely stable since, since February 2023, with a cumulative depreciation of 9% between February and December 2023. Gross international reserves reflected a significant build-up of over 5.9 billion United States dollars, enough to cover 2.7 months of import of goods and services. The current account turned positive at 1.4 percent of GDP at the end of September 2023, from negative 2.1 percent 
at the end of December 2022. Generally, the macroeconomic indicators are once again all pointing in the right direction. I should point out that in all our discussions with the fund, a paramount consideration has been to ensure that the poor and vulnerable do not bear the brunt of the sacrifices that have to be made. Programs like LEAP, school feeding and capitation grant, have been protected and indeed enhanced. Mr. Speaker, right from the start of this government coming into office, we have sought to place the maximum effort on the education and training of the youth as the base for building the prosperous nation we seek. A foreign statesman once posed the question, and I quote, why am I the first member of my parliament in a thousand generations to have gone to the university, unquote. In the past seven years, I've met many people, young and old, across the country, who have told me about the first person in their families, in their communities, to have gone to senior high school. They might well ask the question, why are they the first boy or girl in their family to have gone to senior high school? The answer is not far-fetched. Not being able to go to secondary school for lack of money was so widespread an accepted phenomenon that it led to some people thinking senior high school was not meant for them or their children or for people from their village. And therefore, a child in the family finishing junior school and moving on to senior high school was simply not factored in their expectations. The speaker, free SHS might be, labored, might be labeled by its distractors as a mere political struggling that must be demonized. But it is, in fact, a transformative program that has broken myths and liberated minds. It is humbling on one hand and frightening on the other to think of the sheer number of talents the free SHS has unearthed that would otherwise have ended their formal education at BEC. I know we will get more engineers, doctors, architects, scientists, writers, and poets out of the increased numbers of those attending senior high school who will go into further education. Even if they stop at high school, at senior high school, imagine what a million more secondary school educated young people will do to our self-confidence and the value of our workforce. That alone makes free SHS worthwhile. I'm proud that the MPP government under my leadership has been able to bring this transformative policy into our education system. Mr. Speaker, I believe the success of the free SHS policy has answered its critics and the arguments about it should cease and we should simply concentrate on finding ways to improve it. I'm particularly glad that the fears about lowering of standards have been allayed. Refreshingly, we witnessed through the 2023 batch of free SHS students the best vaccine results in over a decade. Mr. Speaker, there's more to education than free SHS, and government has been paying equal attention to all the other sectors. Kindergarten, primary school, and junior high school must work together to give a solid foundation and strengthen the free SHS policy. The implementation of various programs, such as the capitation grant, feeding grants to special schools, BEC registration for pupils in public junior high schools, among others, have significantly increased access to education at the basic level. The focus of the comprehensive reforms within the sector has been to improve learning outcomes and ensure every child that goes through our education system is equipped with literacy and numeracy skills by the time they exit primary six. 
and national standardized tests for numeracy and reading skills is now being conducted at primary four. Unfortunately, quite a number of children still manage to slip out of the net and miss going to school altogether or drop out at primary school. The Ministry of Education partnered with key development allies to launch an innovative financing program called the Ghana Educational Outcome Project, GEOP. The goal of GEOP is to provide educational support to 72,000 out-of-school children, helping them access complementary education and transition into formal schools. I'm happy to report that 17,340 out-of-school children have been taken through the program and men's streamed into formal schools in 2023. This program has worked so well, it won the GovTech Prize Award in February 2024 at the World Government Summit held in Dubai. Government has remained committed to improving the teaching and learning of STEM education at the pre-tertiary level. Key interventions have included including increasing our ability to produce STEM professionals and also meeting 21st century skills. Accordingly, the curriculum has been overhauled to include STEM career pathways such as aviation and aerospace science, biomedical science, engineering, computer science, manufacturing, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Government has also increased its investment in infrastructure for science, technology, and engineering and mathematics, STEM education, at the pre tertiary level. The construction of 10 STEM schools and 10, 10 STEM centers has commenced across the country, with seven STEM model schools having been operationalized. These schools have been equipped with state-of-the-art laboratories and classrooms dormitories, assembly halls, dining halls, and conducive environments to foster teacher and teaching and learning. The operationalized schools have a total enrollment at present of 2,400 students reading general science and STEM. Mr. Speaker, in recognizing the critical role of technical and universal and vocational education and training, in the country's industrialization agenda. The government continued implementing key reforms in the TVET space, including the expansion of the free senior high school program to include students in public TVET institutes. Mr. Speaker, a lot of resources has gone into the provision of infrastructure at all levels of the educational system. But a lot remains to be done. Many basic schools require more adequate classrooms and furniture. And the environment in some of these schools can be made more suitable for learning and teaching. Some of the senior high schools, especially the community schools recently absorbed into the formal GES structure, lack the facilities that these established schools take for granted. We must all express our gratitude to the teachers in such schools who manage, in spite of the difficulties, to bring out the best in their students and sometimes succeed in achieving great results. They exemplify the best in the Ghanaian and give us hope for the future. Indeed, the one tablet per student policy at the senior high school level is being rolled out and will formally be launched by me next month. It is a great tool to help bridge the gap between disadvantaged and privileged students. Mr. Speaker, free SHS and our no guarantor policy under the Student Loan Trust Fund are breaking down financial barriers for students seeking higher education. By eliminating, by eliminating the requirement for a guarantor, we have empowered students from economic disadvantaged backgrounds to pursue their educational aspirations without undue financial burden. 
This has meant a substantial increase in the number of students seeking tertiary education. And it is in response to this increase, the government has decided to establish four new universities in Mampong, in, Ashan in the Ashanti region, Akrodea in the Bono region, Bonsu in the Eastern region, and Kintapo in the Bono East region, and expand the facilities in existing ones. We are pers pursuing interventions towards achieving by 2030 the 40% growth tertiary enrollment ratio up from the current level of 18.8%, as well as the 60-40 science to humanities ratio from the current one of 40 to 60, as captured in the Education Strategic Plan of 2018 to 2030. The speaker, between 2012 and early 2017, there was nothing more demoralizing than the phenomenon we called Dumsa. It was symptomatic of a dysfunctional system and it caused widespread depression amongst businesses and households. After that experience, my government was determined that Dumsa would not be inflicted upon government, upon Ghana, and Ghanaians, and an MPP government. Shouts will not wish Dumsa away in our history. It will not. After that experience, my government was determined that Dunsa would not be inflicted upon Ghana and Ghanaians under an MPP government. And I'm glad to be able to say, so far, so good. We have managed, we have managed to keep the lights on these last seven years, even in the midst of a financial crisis. We've managed the NFT sector with discipline and expertise to avoid a repetition of the hardships inflicted on Ghanaians some years ago. Furthermore, through determined skillful negotiation, we've been able to reduce considerably the energy sector debt that we inherited. Indeed, the government negotiating team carried out a successful reconciliation exercise with the IPPs and ECG, which established that the IPP arrears position was not the $1.6 billion that had been previously reported in the media, but was, was actually $1.2 billion. That is savings of some $400 million. Additionally, the government negotiating team has reached commercial agreements on headline terms for the restructuring of power purchase agreements and arrears with AXA, Amandi, Sen Power, Senate, and Early Power, and is finalizing remaining definitive documentation of such terms, which will result in total expected savings in excess of $9.1 billion over the lifespan of the IPP projects. In the meantime, ECG has been able to secure a fixed monthly energy purchase price with all the IPPs. This has led to a monthly payment of 43 million United States dollars instead of the 77 million United States dollars. That is monthly savings of $34 million, or a 44% reduction in monthly payments, a far better outcome than the take or pay system we inherited. The Speaker, I'm happy to report that we're making admirable progress in the provision of electricity to all parts of the country. Last year, 207 communities were connected to the grid, taking the current national access rate, electricity access rate to 88.85%. 
We are aiming to achieve universal access this year by connecting an additional 400 communities to the national grid under the South Health Electrification Program and other 10 key projects. As part of efforts to improve power system reliability in the middle and northern parts of Ghana, government took a decision to relocate the 250 megawatt Ameri plant from Abwazi to Anwamasu in Kumasi. The Volta River Authority has successfully relocated six units of the Ameri plant with capacity of 150 megawatts, which are currently being tested and commissioned in Kumasi. The authority is taking steps to relocate the remaining four units before the end of the year. Mr. Speaker, we're also making steady progress in our commitment to increase the component of renewable energy to our energy generation mix. A four megawatt floating solar PV on the buoy reservoir, as well as the 15 megawatt solar PV at Kaleo have been completed and both are operational. We have contributed to increasing our share of solar energy to, in the generation mix to 3.2%. A 100 megawatt solar PV under, is under construction at Bui, as is the mini grid electrification program ongoing in the Adar East District, all of which will help us attain our target of 10% renewable energy in our generation mix by 2030. Mr. Speaker, furthermore, we have committed ourselves to the development of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. As I indicated at the U.S.-Africa Nuclear Energy Summit and the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation Ministerial Conference held in Accra in November last year, the first of its kind in Africa, our energy transition plan envisages 30% of our electricity production to be from nuclear energy by 2070, which is the core mandate of the Ghana Nuclear Power Program Organization, GNPPO, an entity under the office of the President. This strong commitment and position are geared towards the provision of clean and affordable electricity to drive our industrialization agenda. It is also meant to position Ghana as a net power exporter in the ECOWAS region through the West African Power Plume. Mr. Speaker, we have also succeeded in having the Secretariat of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, CVF, an intergovernmental forum of 58 of the most climate vulnerable countries, representing some 1.4 billion people located in Accra. Mr. Speaker, we have all heard about the Gold for Oil program. It has been explained, debated, and talked about. At this moment, all I want to say about it is that the Gold for Oil program has worked well and reduced significantly forex pressures on bulk energy storage, transportation, and bulk imports, distribution and export companies, enable them and enable them to negotiate more competitive premiums with suppliers. Premiums dropped from $180 to $200 per metric ton to $70 per metric ton or less. This also resulted in reduced and stabilized prices at the pumps of between 12 to 13 CDs per liter for the whole of 2023. We're taking steps to rectify some of the handicaps that have limited the full participation of Ghanaians in the oil and gas industry. For years, the well-paid jobs in the industry were taken in exclusively by foreign nationals because we did not have people qualified in these fields. Last year, 150 young Ghanaians were trained and certified as mechanical maintenance technicians, electrical technicians, instrumentation technicians, and production process technicians up to the industry standards. Additionally, five young Ghanaians underwent a 10-month welding inspector training program at the North Alberta Institute of Technology in Canada. 
They have since been placed in various technical institutions in Ghana as instructors. Ghanaians will soon fill the well-paid positions on our, our fields because we have the trained and qualified personnel. Things are looking up. Mr. Speaker, it is quite likely that the most talked about subject in our country is roads and highways. When I appeared in the, la in the House last year, as I said earlier, I took the extraordinary step of coming with a fat book that detailed all the work that the government had done and was doing on roads since coming to office in 2017. I believe it was generally agreed that it was impressive, but it was not enough to satisfy everyone. Well, the work continues, even though some of the major road works have been temporarily interrupted as a result of the debt negotiation. As I said earlier, all the details will be available on the performance tracker. Other mo modes of movement around the country are being built and upgraded to open up the country and make travel easier. Mr. Speaker, the new standard gauge railway line from the port of Chema to Mapaka, Mapak, Ma, Mapakadai in the, in the Asuljaman district in the Asil Demand District of the Eastern Region, covering a distance of some 100 kilometers, is at the final stage of completion. By the middle of the year, the line will be commissioned for operations to commence with brand new standards gauge diesel multiple unit trains, the first of their kind to be used in our country. It is worth mentioning a rail bridge has been built across the Volta as part of this railway line. I have no doubt it will attract a lot of interest. I'm a great believer in the importance of aesthetics as much as the practical. And that is why I encourage the constructors to construct the railway bridge, which was not a part of the original contract across the Volta, to make the journey more scenic. And it made me choke on my, on my glass of water. Extraordinary statement to make. The development is on course of a new standard gauge Western railway line to serve passengers, the mining sector, as well as support industrialization to boost the development and growth of this nation. The plans for the extension of the railway line to Paga might not materialize during the rest of my administration, but I'm sure they will not be abandoned. Mr. Speaker, there's no argument. The food self-sufficiency is the basic requirement for national security and the foundation for building a prosperous nation. Last year, government reviewed the planting for, for food and jobs, PFJ program which had been implemented since 2019. Based on lessons learned, government developed and launched under the dynamic leadership of the new Minister for Food and Agriculture. Everybody who knows me knows I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> Last year, government reduced the planting for food and jobs program which have been implemented since 2017. Based on lessons learned, government developed and launched under the dynamic leadership of the new Minister for Food and Agriculture, the second phase of the PFJ. The second phase of the PFJ sets out a five-year agenda to ensure food sufficiency and resilience. Strategic targets have been set for 11 priority products in the immediate term, September to December 2023, short term, year 2024, 
medium term, 2025, 2026, and the long term, 2026, 2028. The selected products are maize, rice, soybeans, sorghum, tomato, pepper, onion, cassava, yam, plantain, and poultry. <coughs> so I'm happy to report the production estimates for these priority products reveal that the plant targets for the year have been exceeded for all the products except poultry. Poultry obviously requires extra attention. And that is exactly what we are doing. We have every intention of meeting the domestic production targets for poultry this year, 2024, and moving on to production levels that will lead to reduction in poultry imports. We envisage a vigorous cooperation between government and the private sector to achieve the set target. The Speaker, the surest way of making agriculture attractive to young people is to take the drudgery out of farming. And government is continuing to make agricultural machinery and equipment easily available. Under the third and final tranche of the Brazil More Food Program, tractors with accompanying implements, power tillers and ex with accessories, maize shellers, units of combined pharmacists and rice millers have been distributed to farmers, protesters, processors, and mechanization service providers on higher purchase agreement. This year, under the Exim, Indian Exim facility, tractors with matching implements, planters, boom sprayers, combined harvesters, and corn pickers will also be made available. The Speaker, having determined that large-scale commercial farming is the easiest way to achieve our set goal of food self-sufficiency, government under the second phase of the PFJ will establish agricultural zones as a complementary initiative to address the issue of access to large tracts of agricultural land to drive sustainable and commercially orientated agriculture. This will significantly expand Ghana's productive capacity in products such as rice, soybean, maize, and tomato. Indeed, between 2021 and 2023, rice imports fell by some 45%. In 2021, rice imports amounted to 805,000 metric tons. In 2022, 650,000 metric tons. And in 2023, 450,000 metric tons. This healthy trajectory will continue until we achieve full sufficiency in rice production. For each agricultural zone, government will partner with the private sector to provide the necessary irrigation infrastructure develop access roads, expand power, solar and hydro, and provide mechanization services. Various locations across the country with potential to be food baskets have been identified for the establishment of the agricultural zones. They include the Afran Plains, Chopoli, Kumuwu, Krachi, and Nkranza, amongst others. The speaker, we all witnessed a spectacular increment of the cocoa price from 800 CDs per bag to 1,300 CDs. In the to 1,300 CDs per bag in the current co current cocoa season, the highest increase in 50 years. With the current trend of the world cocoa price 
cocoa farmers can be sure that I will do right by them in the next cocoa season. Mr. Speaker, our government has begun the development of 7,100 hectares irrigation infrastructure in five identified economic enclaves within the Afran Plains Agricultural Zone. Work is also continuing towards the completion of the Temne Phase 3 extension and VR irrigation schemes. This will make additional 1,150 acres of irrigable land available for cultivation of rice and vegetables. The Ghana Irrigation Development Authority will continue with the development of small earth dams in the northern, upper east, upper west, northeast and savannah regions to support the One Village, One Dam initiative. Whilst at it, Mr. Speaker, we have not forgotten about the welfare and well-being of our fisher folk. My government has completed the construction of 12 coastal fish landing sites at Axim and Discove in the western region, Moray, Mountford, Winneba, Senyabreku, Gomwafete, Otuam, and Infansiman in the central region, Kesi and Usu in the greater Accra region, and Kita in the Volta region. <laughs> Additionally, I had the pleasure in May last year of commissioning the newly constructed Elmina Fishing Harbour in the central region, much against the hopes of the naysayers. And God willing, soon this year, I will also commission the Jamestown Fishing Harbour, which currently stands at 88% complete and is expected to be ready by August 2024. The Speaker, to help address the incidents of premixed fuel just diversion and hoarding. Government last year completed the installation of 50 out of the 300 pre-mixed fuel automated dispenser. My expectation is that the remaining automated dispensers will be installed by September this year to help optimize the distribution of pre-mixed fuel. Government will continue to take decisive actions such as the closed season to help safeguard the ocean's capacity to regenerate and to continue to, to deliver substantial economic, environmental, and social value for our development. To speak of last year, government regained her position, Ghana regained her position as the leading producer of gold in Africa, having overtaken South Africa. Our gold production reached an unprecedented 4 million ounces, according to preliminary reports. This is as a result of the progressive policies we have been implementing, which have led to the revival of dormant mines like the Obwasi and Vibiani mines and the expansion of existing ones. The reduction in withholding tax on unprocessed gold by small state miners from 3% to 1.5% has resulted in some 900% increment in gold export from the small sector over the last two years. Leveraging on these resources, we introduced the innovative gold for oil policy, which accounts for some 30% of our total crude oil consumption. Three large-scale mines are under construction in Ahafo, Upper East and Upper West regions. With Cardinal Namdini set to pour its first gold in the Upper East region in the last quarter of this year. With these new times, nines, our gold production is expected to increase to some 4.5 million ounces annually. Mr. Speaker, to add value to these volumes of production, we have constructed through a public-private partnership a 400 kilogram capacity gold refinery 
and we're in the final stages of negotiations for a London Bullion Market Association certificate. For our green minerals, including lithium, we have put in place a policy for their exploitation and management to ensure beneficiation across the value chain of these critical minerals. The speaker, as it has been widely reported, Newman Corporation, the world's largest gold producing company, which operates two huge mines in our country and is constructing a third, has announced its intention to sell its Achim mine in the eastern region, the third largest mine in the country, which produced some 420,000 ounces of gold in 2022. As part of government's policy to modernize the mining sector, to indigenize the mining sector, we will engage with Newnot to give priority to Ghanaian investors who will want to acquire this mine to ensure that our mineral resources better benefit the Ghanaian people. The Speaker, we continue to work to ensure the protection of our forests and wildlife resources while reclaiming degraded forests. Some 42 million trees have been planted under the last, over the last three years under the Green Ghana project and some 690,000 hectares of degraded forests have been cultivated between 2017 and 2022 under the Ghana Forest Plantation Strategy. Mr. Speaker, the main cornerstone of our move towards the industrial transformation of Ghana is the one district, one factory policy, this government's iconic flagship initiative. It demonstrates how government can stimulate and incentivize the private sector to expand and diversify manufacturing across the country by harnessing locally available raw materials. It is significant to note that within the relatively short span of six years, government has directly intervened to stimulate interest in and support many private sector business promoters to make significant investments in manufacturing under the one district, one, one factory program. Mr. Speaker, this has led to the development of 321 IDF 1D1F projects consisting of 211 new medium to large scale factories and the conscious enabling of 110 in existing companies to inject significant capital investments into the expansion of production facilities and diversification of products. These business promoters have so far invested in 142 districts across the country, across all 16 regions, and achieving 54% district coverage. The aspiration is to bring a 1D1F project to every district. The speaker, within this period, some 170,000 jobs have been created under the novel ID 1D1F program by companies in operation. Mr. Speaker, government approved a number of incentives, including duty exemptions to support the implementation of the 1D1F program. In 2019 and 2020, 37 1D1F companies were granted exemptions approval by this August House. However, from 2021 to date, no exemptions have been granted. Mr. Speaker, I urge the House to consider and approve all the outstanding exemption applications as a matter of urgency. <laughs> to send positive signals to the business community. The exemptions law that you have provide, passed provides for such exemptions under existing laws. Mr. Speaker, the other initiative 
aimed at stimulating industrial growth that we have been actively promoting is automotive assembly and component manufacturing. It is universally recognized as a key strategic sector for stimulating industrial transformation. The, co the comprehensive automat automotive development policy launched by government in August 2019 has undoubtedly been the catalyst that has attracted a record number of 12 original equipment manufacturers, including Volkswagen, Toyota, Suzuki, Nissan, Peugeot, Kia, Hyundai, Honda, to set up assembly plants and produce a range of models here in Ghana. The speaker is noteworthy that these investments have been accompanied with comp complementary initiatives to build the necessary engineering and technical skills in Ghana. Toyota Ghana has partnered the School of Engineering Sciences of the University of Ghana to establish and operate a modern auto engineering training center for engineering students and the industry to acquire applied auto engineering training. Similarly, Kia Motor Company of Korea has upgraded the Rana Motors West African, West African Vehicle Assembly with state-of-the-art equipment for training of auto repair and maintenance technicians, including repair and maintenance of electric vehicles. The speaker, to spare our industrialization, we're implementing the four project agenda of the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation GearDeck with projects one and two having already taken off. And last month, we signed an agreement for the implementation of project three. Mr. Speaker, we will lay before this August House, at this first meeting of this session of Parliament, a legislative instrument to prohibit the export of, raw, of bauxite in its raw state. We're also in the concluding phase of discussions for the establishment of 450 million United States dollar refinery to refine the manganese we produce. Mr. Speaker, we have all long acknowledged the trade between African countries must increase if we are to make any headway with our dreams of prosperity on the continent. I'm happy to report that the setting up of the AFCFTA with the loss of self-employed enrollment drive, C, an initiative which seeks to improve coverage and increase the contributor base of the SNED scheme. Since the launch of the SNED initiative, some 600,000 self-employed persons have been enrolled onto the program and now have some form of social security cover. Effective 1st January 2024, all pensioners on the SNED pension payroll as of 31st December 2023 have had their monthly pensions increased by 15%. This translates to 10.05% of effective increase for the highest earning pensioners and 36.37% effective increase for the lowest earning pensioners. The 15% indexation rate will result in an additional expenditure of 697 million CDs. The total benefit expenditure for government under the SNED scheme alone is projected to increase from 54, from 5.4 billion CDs in 2023 to 7 billion CDs in 2024. Ms. Bifa, I, say, I believe we can say with certainty that in the tourism sector, Ghana is finally re realizing her long promised potential. Starting from the events and the excitement of the year of returning 2019, Ghana has truly become an attractive tourist destination with visitors' numbers increasing every year. December in GH is now an established and increasingly attractive phenomenon which brings visitors to our country in the month of December and has changed the events calendar around the Christmas holiday season in Accra and many other towns. Mr. Speaker, for the first time since the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park was constructed in 1992, government has undertaken the full modernization and rehabilitation of the facility. 
Since the commissioning of the modern ice park in July 2023, the number of domestic and international visitors has risen dramatically. A national newspaper reporting on activities at the Rivan Park had a screaming headline which said, a Kufuado resurrects in Chroma. <laughs> that gave me pause for a moment. But on reflection, I decided I would accept it, be it a compliment or criticism or an addition to the collection of sayings by elders. Whatever it is, since the commissioning, there have been 208,557 domestic and international visitors to the, car, to the park between 14th July and 31st December 2023. The speaker, compare that, if you may, with the best performance until then, which was in the year of return in 2019, when there were 196,190 vis visitors in the year. Other facilities are being upgraded. And it's good to know that the private sector is showing interest in getting into the development of tourist attractive sites. Mr. Speaker, the National Museum Gallery, which has been closed down since 2015, has also been fully refurbished. It attracted over 35 visitors in 2023. And I'm particularly pleased the school children form a good part of the visitors to these sites. The first ever Kente Museum, uh, aimed at preserving the cultural heritage in Ghana, has been built at Bunwe in the Ashanti region and was recently commissioned by the Second Lady. Preparatory works and designs for the construction of the Heroes Park, a museum to commemorate the founding fathers of Ghana, the Big Six, J.B. Dankwa, Emmanuel Obeche Bilamte, Edward Akufuado, Ebenezer Akwaje, William Ufaracha, Kwame Nkrumah, were completed in December 2023, and construction will commence very soon. Mr. Mr. Speaker, government through the National Film Authority is committed to supporting the production of world-class content and films, as well as increasing the cinema infrastructure in Ghana, and by extension, on the continent. To this end, a favorable fiscal tax regime for FINA cinema projects, including income tax and VAT incentives, import duty exemptions on film production equipment, 20% tax rebate for strategic film productions and film financing reliefs is being elaborated by government, cabinet, which will be outdoored very soon and should provide another tangible reason for the choice of Ghana as a film production country. Mr. Speaker, in line with government's commitment to ensure gender equality, the revised national gender policy and the affirmative action bill were approved by cabinet in October 2023. The affirmative action bill is currently before parliament for consideration and approval. And we count on the support of members of parliament for speedy passage of the bill. The Ghana Enterprise Agency, GEA, is implementing an, uh, an only women support program where micro, small, and medium enterprises owned by women with the potential of sales scaling up their operations, increasing sales, and creating sustainable jobs will receive liquidity support. The GEA is also implementing the U-Star program a youth empowerment program which recently dispersed 100 million CDs to some 3,000 youth beneficiaries to upscale their businesses. Mr. Speaker, we're also implementing some interventions directed at private support for persons with disabilities. In June last year, a significant boost was given to micro, small, and medium enterprises owned by persons with disabilities when government launched the 12 million CD PWD Enterprise Support Program. This grant support program under the Ghana Transformative Project is being funded with the support of the World Bank. Again, the Youth Employment Agency has initiated a groundbreaking employment drive targeting 282 persons with disabilities who used to work at Pearl Booth. 
Speaker, let me now turn to football, a, a sport that is dear to the hearts of all Ghanaians. I'm sure I disclose no state secret if I state that I am myself an ardent football enthusiast and once played in the University of Ghana team with my friend, the late President John Evans Atta Mills, Fifi to me. Throughout the years, the national team, the Black Stars, has held a special place in the affection of Ghanaians. They lifted up our spirits as they dominated Africa and won four continental trophies. They have at other times broken our hearts, but it was not until 2006 that the Black Stars finally broke through to the world stage when they qualified for the World Cup for the first time. You will remember that we rose up as one in our support and they did not disappoint. Then came the spectacular South Africa 2010 World Cup and its drama when we almost became the first African side to reach the semi-finals of the World Cup. It is fair to say that since the sad events of Brazil 2014, many Ghanaians have been left disappointed by some of the recent results of the Black Stars. Their various attempts have, have been made to revive the fortunes of the national team and rebuild the enthusiasm of the people with varying degrees of success. The recent AFCON in Côte d'Ivoire was probably the nadir of the performance of Black Stars and has left the nation saddened. However, I am quite certain that the young men and the technical hand handlers would themselves have wanted to make our nation proud. And I believe that the captain, Andre Dede Ayou, meant every word when he rendered heartfelt apologies on behalf of his teammates to all Ghanaians for the team's early exit. Mr. Speaker, I believe it is time for us to take a long-term, far-sighted approach to correct what has gone wrong. It is time to return to scouting, grooming, and developing talent at the grassroots level under a presidential policy on football that I intend to unveil very soon. The school sports department of the Ministry of Education will work hand in hand with the Ministry of Youth and Sports in collaboration and synergy with the Ghana Football Association to build district, regional, and national juvenile teams for both girls and boys. The more than 150 AstroTurf pitches constructed throughout the country under this administration provide the foundational facilities to make a start as we strive to provide more of them. We should see a steady progression of talent up the ladder from the junior juvenile teams to the senior size based on merit and nothing else. A, special, a similar approach has been tried before under the five-year football development plan led by the late Ben Kofi, initiated under the MPP administration of President J.A. Kufo. It was under this plan the talents such as Michael Asian, Sule Muntari, John Mensah, Derek Boateng, and later Asamwajan and Stephen Appiah were discovered and nurtured. The results became evident to us and the world. It takes time, dedication, and patience. We cannot harvest where we have not planted and irrigated. I have no doubt at all that the black stars will rise and make us proud again. Mr. Speaker, the senior women's team, the Black Queens, who do not get half the attention the Black Stars get, have been performing quite creditably. They have gone for 10 months without any loss until last December, and then when they lost narrowly to Namibia in the qualifying ground for the 2024 Women's African Cup of Nations. Even though they lost narrowly to Zambia in the first leg of the qualifiers for the 2024 Olympic Games, let us wish them well in the second leg to be played in Lusaka tomorrow. I hope they give us something to cheer about. Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to report that all the preparations are ready for Ghana to welcome sportsmen and women from around the continent to participate in the 13th edition of the African Games. It seems incredible, but this is the first time that Ghana will be hosting these games. It's taken a lot of courage to have persisted with the decision to host the Games, especially when our financial problem came 
in the midst of the preparations. But I am glad we went ahead. The preparations are all complete. And I was excited and very pleased with what I saw at Baltimore when I went to commission the Games Village some two weeks ago. We have high-class sporting facilities which will serve us well long after the Games are over. Some of the events will take place at the University of Ghana Sports Stadium. It is worth noting that this is a facility started under former President J.A. Kufour and was abandoned by successor governments. I'm extremely proud that this project has been finished under my stewardship, not just because of the Games, but also because it has taken 75 years of existence for Legon, Ghana's premier university, to have a sports stadium. I urge all Ghanaians to make our visitors welcome and to patronize the Games and cheer on the participants. The speaker, this is the seventh time that I've appeared with this before this house as president to give an accounting of the state of our nation. Luckily for me, I know my way around the place. Having spent 12 memorable years here as a member of parliament, and therefore even on the few occasions the sections of the house did not want to make me welcome, I was still able to manage. I have one more several date with the House when I will be here to give an accounting of my time in office. By that time, my successor would have been elo elected. And, and we will be getting ready for the swearing-in ceremony. The elections will be held peacefully, and the candidate with credibility to take us on to a higher level will win. Let me wish all of us well in the elections on 7th December. Before then, a number of important tasks lie ahead of us, one of which will be commissioning the Nana Ajiman Prempe, the first international airport in Kumasi, and naming the recently commissioned airport in Tamale, the Yakubo Tali International Airport of Tamale. Mr. Speaker, we stumble but we are rising again. We were bruised, but we are healing. We have recovered our footing. We have dusted ourselves off. And now we face tomorrow with confidence. <coughs> every day, every day we pray and hope that adversity may spare our families, our communities, and our dear nation. But should we be confronted by misfortune, we must face it like people with a proud history who fight and do not flee. That is the Ghanaian spirit. That is our armor and our shield. This is our ethos. Let us believe in Ghana. I believe in Ghana. And may God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make her great and strong. I thank you for your attention.
Ora Ume Mes.